going to be continuing in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We'll pick up in verse 12. And before we would do that, we need to ask the Lord to bless this time of Bible study. Heavenly Father, God, we come before you asking that you would open up our hearts and minds to receive all that you have for your children today. Lord, we come here to be fed. We come here to receive the nourishment that we need in our hearts and our minds and our spirits that we may walk in a manner that not only is worthy of your gospel, Lord, but is worthy of the spirit by which you've given us to share that gospel with the world. And so, Lord, we ask these things in the empowerment by your spirit and by your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, last week we had the opportunity to look at the spiritual aspects of the Christian life, and we gained some really valuable insight. We looked at different areas that the Holy Spirit empowers the believer. The apostle identified to us three specific areas, and they were gifts, ministries, and activities. And what we did last week is we defined those different areas, and we found given listed in Romans 12, verse 6, a list of gifts of the Spirit. And they were prophecy, ministry, teaching, evangelism, giving, leading, and mercy. And we went through and we talked about each one of those and how those gifts are made useful in the life of the believer. Then we looked at the list of ministries, once again, as given by the Apostle Paul, and we found that in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. And the ministries that were given were apostle and prophet and evangelist and pastor and teacher. And we took the identification of these gifts and these ministries, and then we went farther into looking in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 7 through 10, and we looked at how these gifts and these ministries are manifested in the life of the believer. And we called those manifestations or activities. And if you join me back in verse 7, it says, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all, and we talked about that. For one is given a word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another a word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, and to another interpretation of tongues." And what we see in that section is we see this empowerment given by the Holy Spirit to know to do, and to speak. And in this power, we we understand that the knowing aspect are these words of wisdom and these words of knowledge. The do comes by virtue of faith and by healings and by miracles. And the ability to speak by the power of the Spirit, well, through prophecy and the discernment of spirits and even tongues and the interpretation of tongues. We are to embrace all of these gifts, all of these ministries, all of these activities. We're not supposed to be fearful of them. We're supposed to be aware of them, how they work, how the Spirit delivers them, because this empowerment that's given by the Spirit is given so that we would be powerful witnesses for Jesus Christ. Is there anybody in here that doesn't want to know more than you know about God? You would want a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom. You want the Lord to provide that. Is there anybody in here that doesn't want to operate in in the gifts and in the ministries that God would provide us through the process of being able to reach the world around us? I hope not. I hope there's nobody in here going, nope, don't want none. I hope everybody says, I want as much as I can possibly have to receive the things of the Spirit and to have them given to me in the power and in the application by which God has designed As we move into this next section, this next portion of the chapter, what we're going to see is the apostle talk about how it is that as believers we're to come together, working together in the use of this power supplied by the Holy Spirit. How it is that that we would operate and function as a body. Now remember, Paul is addressing division in the church. The entire first portion and even now moving into this is addressing not only the carnal division that was happening, and you know we went through that whole process of how they were treating each other up into and including in times of fellowship and feast. And now we've transitioned into the aspect of proper order and proper structure when it comes to the spiritual applications and uses within the church. So the apostle is still in this aspect of talking about how it is as a people of God we're supposed to function. We're supposed to work together. We're not supposed to take and allow especially our own personal interests to rise above what is good for the whole. 
I want to take this next section from verse 12 all the way through the end of our text today, and I want to read it together because I don't know if you know this or not, but you realize that the Bible didn't come in chapter and verse. When Paul wrote this, he didn't say, okay, okay, chapter 12, verse 12, and then he wrote and got to the end of the first sentence and said, now verse 13. He didn't do that. Those addresses, those places for reference were added so that we could find and easily interpret by virtue of location the space to to do study it was added and so the way that this was written and sometimes when we read scripture and we read it at the scriptural breaks based on chapter and verse we miss the intent we miss the entire process behind what was being said so i want to read this this morning so please turn with me in your bibles chapter 12 verse 12 for as the body is one and has many members But all the members of that one body, being many, are one body. So also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were baptized into one body. Rather Jew or Greeks, rather slaves or free, we have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For in fact the body is not one member, but many. And if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now, indeed, there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think are less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need but God. God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice in it. Now, you are the body of Christ, and members individually And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, and then gifts of healings, helps, administration, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. The Apostle Paul is talking about this aspect of unity in Christ, that we are all one in Christ as Christ is one. You realize Christ doesn't have a different criteria for you than he has for me. There's no difference in how he sees people. As a matter of fact, everyone comes to salvation through the exact same program, if you will. It is all based on the grace of God by faith in Jesus Christ. And because of that, anyone and everyone, it doesn't matter who you are, can come to salvation in Jesus Christ. You guys realize that? When, when, when folks talk about how, how it is that God is somehow unfair, he's not unfair. He's made a process by which anyone, it doesn't matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done, by faith in Jesus Christ, you can receive, receive eternal life. That's pretty fair. As a matter of fact, I think it's more than fair. I think it's, well, we're not going to get into what I think. It really doesn't matter. <laughs> by faith in Jesus Christ. Why? Because it's part of a plan. When we come to Jesus Christ, we are made part of the body of Christ, part of the functioning body in unity of Jesus Christ. Why? So that we can carry out the command that he's given us. And what did Jesus command us to do? He wants us to preach the gospel to every what? Every, everything, everywhere, everybody. Making disciples in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy. He wants us to take his gospel of salvation and take that to the entire world without exception. 
And so the empowerment that we have, the process by which we would be united as one body, serves that purpose in order that we would be able to fulfill this great commission. Here's how it's supposed to work, how it's supposed to work. You ready? Those who by faith call Jesus Christ Lord are to come together and work together. Wow, what a novel concept. We're to come together. And the picture that draw, is drawn by Paul is very, very clear. It's many parts, different parts, different in function, different in form, all working together with the exact same purpose. The exact same purpose. Now, the Lord referred to us, and we are given this image and this, this idea of a body for good reason. For good reason. I mean, he could have called us anything that he wanted. He could have used other terms. He could have called us an assembly, and it would still fit. He could have called us an incorporation because we're in corporate communication with each other. He could have called us a gathering or a team or some other word that would sum us up. But instead, he calls the church, and he refers to the church as a body. And this is because within that, each and every one of us, regardless of our capacity to understand those other terms, have got a body. Everybody in here got a body? How many are not happy with the body you got? We've already been there, right? How many of you think that your body is somehow or another not everything you wanted it to be. And now you're discovering parts of your body that you never knew were an issue, but now have made themselves loud and proud. <laughs> wow. Man, I didn't know I had so many body parts until most of them started hurting. I never also, I never understood why it was that my grandfather and my dad, every time that they got up or they sat down, they went, ah! <laughs> I now know. It's hard. You don't have a choice. It just comes out. So because we have bodies, we understand how bodies work, how when things are correct, when things are right. And you guys realize how amazing the human body is? I mean, I, mean, I think that sometimes we just overlook the level of sophistication in the design and the function, function and how it identifies without any exception this incredible intelligence and by design the power of our creator God. There is nothing beyond the human body in the world that has more sophistication. There's not. As a matter of fact, Psalm 139 and 13 says this. It says, For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. The verse speaks of this incredible design of our physical bodies. The human body is, without exception, the most complex creation in all of the world. And this complexity reveals the very nature and the intelligence of God. You realize that every aspect of our body, everything that you see, even the parts you don't like, even the stuff that works and the stuff that doesn't work, cries out, fearfully and wonderfully made. There's no exception. When we, when we look at what's going on within this aspect of who we are as a human being, when we look at all of the modern marvels of man, you know, man's pretty proud of himself. You realize that, right? I mean, technology, medical advances, scientific advances, engineering. How many of you like watching those like, like engineering disaster shows? I think that those are great. I mean, I love to see it when they build this incredible building or this bridge, and all of a sudden it just it falls down. And all of the best efforts and all of the brain space and everything that went into that and all the best technology that man can muster does not in any way, shape, or form even come close to the complexity of any aspect of the human body. For everything that man has produced, it looks like a tinker toy in relationship to the human eye. It looks like a child's toy. It looks like it's absolutely nothing when we compare it to what it is that God has created. Darwin had this to say. He was the creator of evolution, by the way, or at least the promoter of evolution. He created something 
is wrong, but he created it, said this in his book, Origin of Species. To suppose that the eye, with all of its imitable contrivances for adjusting focus to different distance, for admitting different amounts of light, and for the correction of spiritual, spherical and chromatic aberration. He was smart, way smarter than I am. Could have formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest degree possible. All right, let me translate that for you because I had to translate it for me, okay? Darwin says that the eye is so complex that there is absolutely no way that it could have been a product of natural selection. Now, this is the guy that said that we all got here by natural selection. He takes one aspect of the human body. He takes the human eye, and he says it is so complex, the things that it does, the means by which it's able to take in and, and, and transfer vision and create sight and admit the right amount of light. Have you ever thought about what your eye does? I mean, everything that man has tried to replicate in relationship to the eye, think about cameras and all that stuff, is taken from what they've learned about the human eye. And the reason there's a Hubble telescope is because they studied the human eye to determine how to do optics. And even that is nothing compared to the human eye. And what Darwin says is it is absolutely absurd to think that the complexity of the human eye could have been by a process of evolution. And we don't see that per, you know, when people talk about evolution is true. Well, even the guy that you're saying created the whole process says it doesn't work, that he has no means by which he can explain. It's interesting. I had to go look up this word. <laughs> I had, had to go look up the, 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 this word immutable, right? And what it means is it means that it's so good and so unusual that it is impossible to copy. Impossible to copy. That sounds just like God, isn't it? Then it sounds just like God. He's so good, and he's so unusual that it's impossible to copy God. And yet, the eye is extremely simple in comparison to the human brain. To the brain! Our brains have the capacity to learn they have the capacity to reason. Do you realize that your brain controls the automatic functions of your body? You know, you're not thinking about breathing, but you're doing it. You're not thinking about all of the processes, your heart rate, and what's going on within your body and what's taking place, this automatic function that is allowing you to be able to sit here and to be able to breathe and to maintain, to process things. Your digestive system is working without even your help. Oh, it tells you when it doesn't like you, but it works without you. And all of those things take place on their own. Your brain is functioning to meet all of those needs. But then it goes beyond that point. It goes on to this point to where also not only the automatic, but you're able to concentrate, you're able to remember, you're able to perform and do complex functions all at the same time. Isn't it good that when you have to think about changing the channel on the TV that your breathing doesn't stop? Think about it for a minute. How many of those things would you be in big trouble if you assigned brain space to in order to be able to take and initiate had to shut down somewhere else? Most scientific surveys say, at best, we as human beings use 10% of our brain capacity. And actually what they say is that from any given time, it's more like from 1% to a maximum of 16%. So from the basic aspects of just breathing and staying alive, all the way up to the very, very best and brightest and, and most, most complicated application is 1% to 16%. Now, I know which end of the scale that I'm on. I've got just a little bit more than breathing. And there's times when I think that I'm operating at 0.5% because I'm just barely sustaining life. All right? But think about what's taking place here. Think about what's happening. And then translate that to the sophistication of DNA. Of DNA. DNA, a single strand that contains all of the codes, all of the blueprints for life itself. 
that this strand of DNA that is processed and it is present at the time of, of, of the fertilization of an egg carries with it at that instant a set of instructions that will form an entire human being. How amazing is that? How amazing to think that there are millions of these strands, billions of these strands within a single human being, and every one of them is completely unique to that individual. That's why they can do a TNA, DNA test and they can determine that this was you that did this thing because your DNA is a p- perfect fingerprint of who you are that doesn't match anybody else in the world. Oh, it can be close. They can find distant relatives and blood relatives and even identical twins sometimes can potentially share the same kind of DNA. But you know what? This is off the hook. This is something that is so far beyond anything that we could imagine in the complexity of how God has created this physical body. Now, the question is, now that you kind of get the picture, we're fearfully, we're wonderfully made by a creator God with millions and millions of parts that are meant to function as a unit in perfect harmony. Why the anatomy lesson? Well, It's important that we understand this very same God, through the power of his Holy Spirit, has created the body of Christ to function the same way. The goal is for us to function perfectly in relationship to the design that God has created for the body. The same God. And what it also means is it means that we have the ability, we have the capacity, by virtue of the fact that we've been empowered by the Holy Spirit, to do so, but we need to embrace it. Jesus prayed in John 17, 21 through 23, he said that they all may be one. He's talking about us. As you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me and the glory which you gave me I have given to them that they may be one just as we are one. The goal is to be one, like-minded, in the same aspect of Christ being in the Father and being one. He says, I've given to them everything they need to be as one in me as you and I, Father, are one in each other. There's a theme here. How many of you see the theme of oneness? Oh. God's design is that we as a church would be one in Christ. And the question is, is how is this accomplished? Look at verse 13. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. The only way that our physical body can function properly is if it is subject to the central control and direction of a healthy mind, of the brain. There has to be a healthy mind, a healthy direction, something that is directing and and, and coordinating the efforts of the body. Guys, listen, the only way that the body of Christ will operate properly is when it is subject to the central control and the direction of the Holy Spirit. It's the only way that the body's going to operate. Stephanie and I just returned from a, a conference in, in that place, over there, the People's Republic of California. <laughs> but I'm here to tell you, we met all kinds of cool body parts. We met some body parts that we recognized, and we met a bunch that we had never even known we had. We met body parts we didn't even know we had. It was wonderful. And what brought us together was the Spirit of God. What brought us together was the mind of Christ. What brought us together was the Word of God. One of the central themes that we talked about as we went through this process had to do with how does like-mindedness come together. And I want you to hang on to this because this is going to be the theme for the rest of the message. The mind for the body of Christ 
is Christ revealed through his word? That, that's how we get the mind of Christ. We can only have the mind of Christ as it is revealed to us and given to us and interpreted to us by the Holy Spirit, by the word of God. You cannot know Christ any other way. You can imagine him. You can create a, 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 an ideal. You can envision him. But the only way that you will know the mind of Christ is the empowerment of the Holy Spirit as revealed by the Word of God. Everybody say amen. amen. Now, it's important that you hold on to it. It's important that you take and you, you lock that in. We talked in many of the sessions about how it is that we would find unity within the church, how it is that we can be like-minded. And during several of the sessions, it started rolling into my head based upon the message that you guys are now hearing about how it is that, wow, there's, there's some parallels here to what I'm seeing, what I'm, what I'm looking at in Scripture and what I'm seeing that they're talking about and what's happening in the world. And about how it is that, that, that if there's going to be unity, that we have to understand that just as our physical bodies will only work properly under the direction of a healthy mind, and we know what it looks like when the mind isn't healthy. We know what happens in the form of mental maladies. And I mean, so we don't need to go in it. We know when everything's working right, when the body's doing the, 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 the will of the mind and the mind is healthy, that things are going to work properly, right? Agreed? That the exact same thing happens in the body of Christ. <laughs> when the body of Christ is responding to that which is of Christ, revealed in his word, then we're going to find ourselves operating as to how it is that the church is designed to operate. All right. You guys have to stay with me here because you guys know that the Lord has a tendency to use really small words and lots of pictures in order for me to understand things. And so we're going to go through this kind of slowly, and hopefully you'll be able to take and stay with me. The first thing I saw is it pointed to the dysfunction of the world. The first thing that I started thinking, I think, well, why, well, why is it then that the world is so messed up and it's because there's too many minds. There's too many brains. There's, there's too many other ways to see things and to be centrally, centrally controlled by what it is. And guys, we have to understand that there are all kinds of influences that are pushing and pulling people in all kinds of different directions. And by and large, people are being controlled by these different minds, by different mindsets, different values, different ideals. And for this reason, listen, 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 they will never be united. Even in the causes that are united against Christians, they're not united because they cannot be. They're all using different sources of what it is that would unite them. They're all using different ideals. In the Scripture, we're told very clearly that this is an indication of what happens in the end times. We're told that what's going to happen is, is that people are going to take and refuse the coming together in unity with the mind of God and refuse God to the point that everybody will do what's right in what? Their own eyes. In their own minds, in their own hearts, and they'll follow whatever it is that is right for them. And how many people have you heard explain that, well, that may be right for you, but it's not right for me? And the question is, 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 is it right at all? Because right now we live in a world that has no semblance and no idea, no concept of absolute truth. And so when somebody says, well, that's right for you, and I go, no, 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 it's not just right for me. It's just right. It's just right. So rather you believe it, whether it's right for you or it's right for me, we need to separate that out and quit trying to figure out if it's right for this person and not right for that person and just determine if it's right to begin with. And this is where we have the conflict within the world. But understand what's happening here. Paul's not talking to the world. We should expect that the mind of God is going, or mind of man is going to be dysfunctional as compared to the mind of God. If we don't expect that, then we're hoping for something that cannot happen in relationship to man's venture for knowledge. But those who've been baptized into one body, who have one mind, should never be brought to the place of division. And there should not be division in the church. So the question is, why is there? Look at verse 15. If the foot should say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? 
If the whole body was an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them in the body, just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? Good question, isn't it? If, if, if we were all exactly the same, if we didn't have different functions, if we weren't both ears and eyes and feet and arms and all of these parts of the body, where would we be? We would just be a lump of something sitting on the ground with no ability to move. I mean, that's what would happen. Here's the problem, the main problem that is causing division within the church. It's the failing to operate under the control and the direction of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to say that again. The main problem that is creating division within the church is failing to operate under the control and the direction of the Holy Spirit. This means that we're not operating with the mind of Christ as provided in the Word of God. Now, we've already determined that the only way a physical body can function is to be subject to the mind. It's the only way it can work. And we know, like I said, when there's a disconnect, when there's a problem, when there's brain damage or some sort of traumatic injury or something that we can lose the ability to communicate with the body, and we know what dysfunction looks like in that area. But the only way that the body can respond in perfect harmony is it has to submit to the mind. It has to be willing to allow the mind to drive. There has to be that which is in control and that which is in charge because we all know that if we let the body drive, we are messed up. The same is true for the body of Christ. If the parts of the body refuse to follow the instruction of the Holy Spirit, listen, if the parts of the body refuse to follow the instruction of the Holy Spirit, thus the mind of Christ, as is found in the Word of God, then there's going to be dysfunction in the body of Christ. If the foot says, because I can't be a hand, then I'm not of the body, then it is out of line with the will and the mind of God, and it is then outside of the body of Christ. It's really that simple. Look at verse 20. But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And if the eye cannot say, or the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body. Underline that, the first part of verse 25. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. And if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. In a healthy body, there can be no schism. Schism is another word for separation, miscommunication, misdirection, unwillful obedience. If there's separation or unwillingness to follow the mind, the body is not going to perform as it should. Now, here's where it gets a little tough. Listen, please, carefully. Today, there are many, many minds that are seeking to control the body of Christ. There are minds of false prophets that are putting out a false and an inaccurate doctrine. There's the mind of man that says that we can have everything that we want spiritually without yielding to the Spirit. There's a woke culture that wants to, by any means possible, even by force, direct and dictate how it is that Christians are supposed to worship and understand their God by virtue of holding it up to the mirror of a woke cultural reflection. The government wants to tell us how to do church and how it is that we're, you you can be united, you just can't come together. You can can watch on TV, but you can't go into the church house. We're going to tell you how, and we're also going to start getting to the point to where we're going to tell you and we're going to dictate what your pastor can say from the pulpit because we certainly don't want him to provide anything that would be offensive 
But let me tell you what happens when that is put in place is that if the church succumbs in any way, shape, or form to this aspect of not focusing upon the mind of God and instead falls into the mind of Satan, which is driving all of these other mindsets, then the church is going to find itself being dysfunctional. We are going to be suffering from spiritual mental illness. And that's what's happening in the church is there's too many minds that are speaking into the church. There are too many minds. There's the mind of the government. There's the mind of man. There's the mind of the culture. There's the mind of all these things. And the church is listening to and and applying themselves to these other mindsets rather than seeking out and following the mind of Christ. That's what's happening. And it's not difficult to see. It's very simple to understand. But boy, is it hard to apply because of all of the other minds, because of all of the other encouragement to follow. Another way of thinking. Guys, there's not any other way to say it. Any church that is not adhering to the Word of God, is not yielding to the power of the Holy Spirit, is outside the mind of Christ. It's that simple. It's also true for any Christian. Listen, Christian, we are the church. (laughs) When I say church, I'm not talking about, well, this building is really messing up terribly. Boy, they should straighten out that building. No, no, the church is sitting right here in front of me. Any Christian who is not in adherence to the Word of God, to the mind of Christ, and following the direction of the Holy Spirit is outside of the body of of Christ is not operating in a proper fashion. Now, I know that for some people, boy, I say that and think, oh, that's so mean. That's so harsh. I mean, how unloving is it for, for you to tell people that if they're not doing everything exactly right, I'm not saying you got to do everything exactly right, because there also is within that word of God grace and there's mercy and there's the allowance for us to ask for forgiveness of sin. But that what there is not is the allowance for us to stay in sin and say that it's okay with God and say that somehow or another that that now is our new understanding and the new mindset that God applies to his church. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. I want you to hear me because this is as loving and as truthful as I can possibly put it. The truth requires that we speak out. Love requires that we speak out in truth. They can't be separated. You can't have truth without love, and there is no love without truth. It just, it, they, they walk side by side. They have to be compelled and brought about together. Those who say it doesn't matter who you marry. Those that say that there are no absolutes when it comes to gender. Or those that will tell you that it's okay to be a part of the body and still be a pro-abortionist or pro-death. Those have disconnected themselves from the mind of Christ. They've removed themselves from the body of Christ by virtue of their own decision, their own choice, their own moving away. For those that will tell you that somehow or another that God's word is not infallible, that you don't have to believe everything in God's word, that you don't have to take God at his word, that there's only portions of it. I can't tell you how many pastors I've heard and preachers that I've heard stand in front of a congregation and say, these are not all the words of God, it's just the Bible contains some of the words of God. God is a lie straight from the pit of hell. It is God's words from Genesis to Revelation. It is complete and is fulfilled through the person of Jesus Christ. Nothing else added, nothing taken away will get us to the point that we understand. That's how we have the mind of Christ. That's how we operate in an insane world and maintain our sanity by the Holy Spirit. (laughs) How many of you wonder sometimes how close you are to the edge? Just one more thing, man, and I'm going total bonkers. I, I was thinking the other day, how much fun would it be to just tell you guys, visit me on Saturday afternoons and bring some crayons and we'll color together. It would be great. <laughs> Why is this so critical? It's only when the body of Christ is united in the minds of Christ that we will be able to walk in the power promised through the Holy Spirit. 
We wonder why it is that the church, church lacks power today. I can tell you why the church lacks power. There's too many minds involved. The church lacks power because we've gotten away from following the mind of Christ and the Word of God. And if we're outside of that, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit is not going to make itself known within the church. It's that simple. Only when the body is taking direction from the Holy Spirit will we also be able to celebrate the differences in the body and see them as an enhancement and not as a schism, as not as a separating point. Look at verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually, and God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, and then gifts of healing and helps and administration, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts. And yet, I show you a more excellent way. The apostle ends by saying, I'm showing you a more excellent way. And the more excellent way is when we operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit based upon the mind of Christ. In the right mind. We can't be out of our minds and think that somehow or another that the Holy Spirit is going to operate and manifest these gifts and these these aspects of ministries and administrations. When we're like-minded with Christ, the body comes together to serve in his purpose. Here's one of the great examples. This is wonderful. Today is an example of like-mindedness, the things in Christ. Do you realize that as a mission for this church, our mission to this community, to reach out to the community, is to love, teach, and reach? If you haven't seen it lately, just look on the front of the bulletin, all right? It's everywhere you, that's what we do. We love, we teach the word of God, and we reach out to every heart, every hand in this valley is the mission that God gave us and continues to be our mission. But in order to do that, it takes a lot of parts. It takes a lot of different body parts in order to fulfill that like-minded mission. This morning, there's parts in here that were people that directly touched others in the community and invited them to church. God bless you for being that body part. Wow, you're out there evangelizing and inviting people and encouraging them to come back into the house of the Lord. There were parts that were here this morning. How many of you met the body part that was the greeters at the door? Aren't those cool body parts? I love the fact that there are these body parts, that they're, they're function within the body on this particular day. Now, understand, it doesn't mean that that's the only thing they do, but on this particular day, they were called to be the body part to greet you and to be nice to you. Who else will do that unless it's guided by the Spirit of God? Oh, the greeter in Walmart, maybe, but that's another whole situation. (laughs) I've often thought that if I didn't do this, that's the only other job I could tolerate. (laughs) Hi, how you doing? You need a sticker on that? Yeah, I I think that's a great job. There were parts that came in and set this house up. There's, there's been body parts here all during the week. There was body parts here that were here early this morning to open the doors and turn on the air and make sure that things were clean. And there's tissues underneath the seats and there's toilet paper in the restrooms. And there's, there's all of these things that were taken care of in order for when God's people came in, when the guests of God came into the house of God to have unity with the Spirit of God through the Son of God and through the Word of God, that all would happen in a way. And those body parts showed up and did that this morning. There were body parts that were just up here on the stage a little while ago that were leading in worship. There's body parts running all over the place right now that are providing for our safety and our, for secu- our security in the house of the Lord, making sure that there are no threats that come in that would take and overwhelm us and overcome us. I love those body parts. There's body parts that are right now caring for the children. And in the second service especially, we'll be overwhelmed with the kids that that are here, and they will be taking care of the body parts that will do what your body parts don't even want to do. Isn't that great? Body parts that teach the Word of God. I'm so blessed in this fellowship now, and and, and to, to share ministry here with Pastor Gill and with those that are here taking responsibility for the teaching of God's Word to the people of God so that they may be like minded with God. And then we have those body parts that are going to be here after you're gone. You'll make the mess and you'll leave it. And there'll be body parts that are here to clean up after you. You see, there's, there's no aspect of, of, of 
not wanting different body parts. We need different. If everyone was singularly focused in the exact same area, then everything else except that one item that I just listed, which just is a small portion, wouldn't get done. So the Apostle Paul said, it's great that there's all these different bodies. Don't give any preference to one over the other. As a matter of fact, some of the parts that you think are great are not so much. And some of those parts that you think you don't need, try to get by without it. But the focus behind it has to be that it is like-minded, or the body will not function as God has designed it. We can celebrate the usefulness of all of the body parts when they're all following the same plan. And guys, I want you to understand, again, there is room for a lot of differences. I love the fact that there's diversity. I love the fact that there are different mindsets and there's different skills and there's different abilities, the different parts. But we need to make sure we're following the mind of Christ. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. So do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And what we're told is that the way that our minds are renewed is by the washing of the Word of God. Guys, that's how we become like-minded. It's how we honor God, how we give glory to God, how we do so in such a way that we would walk as the Apostle Paul has identified the more excellent way. So I want to encourage you today, if you're, if you're feeling disconnected, if you're feeling like maybe there's, there's aspects of your life where you're, you're not necessarily empowered by the Spirit, and these, you know, we talked through the gifts last week, and some of you, I know you left out of here going, man, I wish I had one of those. Man, I wish the Lord would just really empower me in a particular area. And maybe you've even been praying for that. What I'm going to ask you to do also is to take and figure out who it is that you're listening to. Whose mind are you following? And the key to understanding the mind of Christ is to be in the Word of God. Because that's where you're going to find it. You're not going to hear it listening to Christian music. You're not going to hear it taking and being a casual observer of the things God. Christian t-shirts are great. I love wearing Christian t-shirts. I wore one yesterday all the way home coming out of Southern California, one of my favorite, not even really a Christian t-shirt. It was one of our founding father's statements. I'm not going to tell you what it was, but boy, people were looking at it. Who said that? Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine, wasn't he one of the founders? He was absolutely one of the founders. My wife had on a shirt that said dibs on the pastor. That was even more fun. Because <laughs> people would come up to me and they'd say, are you the pastor? I said, no, and I'm trying to figure out which one she's got dibs on. <laughs> All of those things that we do to live out our lives, and we create that aspect of empowerment through the Holy Spirit of the witness of our life, is great. It's one of, do that. But if it's not founded and grounded in the Word of God, in the mind of Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, we won't be connected as a body. Amen? And the goal, as Jesus Christ said, is that we would be one as He and the Father are one. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we thank You. We thank You for the example that we see in Your Word and how it is that, that as we would look at this, we would recognize and we would realize that it's, it's not difficult to understand but, Lord, it requires something. It requires our willingness to submit. Our willingness to take and to give in to the power of your Spirit, Lord, to do so based upon our knowledge of Jesus Christ, of who he is as revealed by your word, not in something that we've made up, not the Jesus that we want, that loves everything and everyone regardless Oh, yes, is there unconditional love? Absolutely, but salvation is conditional. It requires faith in your son, Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean that because God loves all that God will receive all. His love is equal to everyone, and everyone has the opportunity, but without making a choice of our own will to follow the mind of Christ, to follow the example, to receive what he has provided, Lord, we'll never come into right standing with you. 
And so, Lord, may it be that as we would communicate this, that it would encourage all of the, the body that is gathered here today to seek you out, to look and to, to, to see how it is that we can have this perfect unity, that we would spur each other onto that, that we would encourage each other in that, and that we would take and we would look forward to a unity that goes beyond anything that the world will ever have because we're united in you. And, Lord, it first starts in the heart of the believer, individually, and then spreads collectively. So, Lord, we thank you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.